Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Joining me today is author and former fashion model, Annabelle Lee. And she's here to talk about her new cookbook, The Ultimate Grain-Free Cookbook, which is music to my ears and I think to my taste buds. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Gundry. I am really honored to be here. Well, we appreciate you coming on. And I guess we're really neighbors. You're from Temecula, California. Temecula, California, yes. One of the last areas of Southern California where there are real horses and pigs and chickens. <laughs> Remind me about horses later on because we have a reader question that we're going to talk about oats. And oh. we'll get your opinion, then I'll give you my opinion. So okay. uh, my oldest daughter is a horsewoman. She's got six horses, so Ooh. we'll talk about oats. Wonderful. So what took you to Temecula, first of all? Well, let's see. We had, uh, we had four young men uh, growing quickly, and we were looking for a place that we could still buy property that was affordable. These are your and kids, I assume? Our kids, yes. Oh, okay. Four boys. <laughs> and uh, uh, we found Temecula. We were in the Southern California area at the time, and uh, I've always loved Temecula, the smell of the orange blossoms that used to be there and now it's a, a lot of grapes but uh, it's it's beautiful and uh, there was lots of space to uh, find some property to raise our boys and that's what we did sure. and we built our own house and uh, used a lot of teenage muscle <laughs> to help us stand walls and such and when it sounds like you needed some teenage muscle because you've actually dealt with uh, Issues of autoimmune disease. Yes. And do you want to you want to go into that because uh, that's an area of my interest as well. Yes, and you've done so much to help. You've opened my eyes so much as well. Um, well, my story goes actually back a couple of years to when I was about eighteen. <laughs> couple, eh? <laughs> um, I, after I had my or during the time I was pregnant with my first child, I um, got a urinary tract infection first and only one I ever had, and I received antibiotics and didn't think too much of it because it was supposedly normal. But uh, after I had uh, Josh, um, I began experiencing like uh, mysterious knee swelling and pain. And um, the doctors, you know, of course, tested me. Oh, rheumatoid arthritis was always the first one. And they did all kinds of tests. And uh, then the swelling would go away on its own and uh, nobody knew what it was, it was just mysterious. And uh, then throughout the years, uh, we moved back east and I kept really busy. We had uh, more children and after each child, especially, my knees would swell, come and go. And uh, no doctors could, they were drained and tested and they could never figure it out. So um, I just kind of chalked it up to being uh, under stress and this was what my hormonal or something that my knees did so um, that was years ago and uh, um, it just kept happening and uh, eventually I wound up getting uh, another infection and uh, this one was years later where I uh, I felt like I couldn't raise my arms within days it was not it was a um, uh, a food, um, I got it from food, mm -hmm. so uh, it was very, it was, a, it was scary, but then it went, it kind of went away. Uh, but then not long after that, I began experiencing widespread joint and muscle pain. And uh, my knees swelled up terribly then, and I, I wouldn't be able to get rid of the swelling. And um, I had all kinds of things going on, um, and one of the first things I gravitated to was to uh, um, quit gluten, right? Because that's like, oh, well, maybe, maybe there's gluten. I was having digestive issues, too. I was putting on weight and just not feeling well. And I was reaching probably my 40th birthday at that time, and um, so I quit gluten. But... Uh, Unfortunately, when I, I like to bake, and also I would buy things as well, but gluten-free uh, products are so full of starches and other grains that are not good for you. Um, 
and sugars and, and sugars. that. Yes. So I really started putting weight on, in, mostly in my midsection. And I was like, wait a second, I'm, I think I'm eating healthier and I'm not. And so I really looked into the labels and what I was eating and realized that all this sugar and starch was not the way to go. Did more research and found that um, what I felt was to eliminate grains um, because of not the lectins at that time because I didn't understand that, but uh, all the starches that are in grains and um, just the fact it didn't make sense to me. I, in uh, our company, we, we say grains, silly people, grains are for the birds because uh, those are real grain eaters. And I, I think of human beings as, uh, you know, not grinding up little pieces of grain to, to sustain themselves is one thing, but we eat massive amounts in this country. And so and when I stopped eating the grains and uh, the starches and the sugars, a really funny thing happened. Uh, I, I thought I was eating fairly healthy. I didn't eat sugar very much, but what people don't realize is when you, you're eating uh, grains and starch, that turns to sugar and then when you add sugar to it as well you're just inundating your body with this um, processed sugar so when i quit doing this uh, to my body and not even little bits i literally broke out my torso broke out in little hives all over and the back of my head this is kind of gross but it's true um, i got like a cradle cap in the back of my head, which is what you know babies are born with uh, when there's too much yeast in their bodies, mm -hmm. right? And so my body was literally, I guess the yeasts were starving and they were, my body was sloughing them off. And I had this in the back of my head for probably two months before it completely disappeared. And then these, all these little bumps finally disappeared. And um, I felt like a new person, <laughs> you know, my aches and pains had diminished um, a lot, uh, and uh, I gradually started losing my what I call a starch belly, and um, I just felt uh, much better. So I knew that this was the path I was going to stay on, and I really started um, developing uh, comfort food type recipes to um, feed my family because I couldn't just cook for myself, knowing that I was feeding them things that weren't good or letting them buy crap at the grocery stores when I knew I was eating healthy. So I tried to combine things. We also lived uh, out in the country, so it was a ways from the grocery store. So I had my the teenage boys and husband, they were kind of captive, and they had to eat what I made them. <laughs> but luckily, uh, I'm a pretty good cook, and I came up with some good comfort food recipes, everything from lasagna and gnocchi to the breads, which are my favorite. And uh, everybody got happy. <laughs> was there a lot of complaining in the household when you started doing this? No, because they didn't really realize that I had switched over um, and I found sweeteners that I could use. Um, and in, in the early times, I used erythritol and stevia, but now I use mostly monk fruit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the monk fruit is so great, but uh, when you combine them in the right quantities in that, the, uh, the taste is so similar to sugar that, um, you know, no one complains at all. And uh, so I, I, it turned into this. <laughs> right. and, and so this has been a, a labor of personal love for yourself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, have, have the family members seen any difference in their health or they um, just went along for the ride? They, quite honestly, they've kind of grown up and they did, they did good, but they didn't really realize uh, any difference at the time. They, that was how mom cooked and how we ate weird and mom. everything, weird mom. But um, uh, they were all really good about that. Now they're young men and they're off on their own and stuff. And so I can't really uh, say, them. I can't control what they're eating, but I do know that they, when they come home and they're reminded when they don't eat like they should, or you know they they do feel a difference and uh, most of most of them are all really um, careful about what they eat because they they felt a difference well I think that's interesting because certainly in in my patient population um, when we get them not only grain free but for the most part lectin free mm -hmm. when they stray or they cheat they almost immediately feel it 
right. in one way or another. And right. that's always been interesting to me. Uh, some of you know our, our best folks will sometimes just goof. Uh, they'll forget something. Yeah. Um, like the lady I talk about in the book who went on a cashew kick and oh. her, her markers for rheumatoid arthritis reappeared. And when I met with her, I said, you know, you're cheating on something. <laughs> and she said, uh, no, I'm not. You know me. And I said, yeah, there's, you're cheating on something. And we went down the list and cashews. And she said, oh, my gosh, you know, I've got a bag of cashews in the car right now. I completely forgot right. about them. Right. So, yeah, it's really interesting that usually you can find ways of convincing people just by the way they feel exactly. to, to do this. Right. So when were you actually diagnosed with an autoimmune disease? or um, About four years ago. I was not real big on, on uh, going to a lot of doctors, and the ones I went to seemed to want to, they wanted to put me on prednisone, they wanted to put me on uh, methotrexate more recently, which is a chemo drug. And um, it, it was the, the way Western doctors wanted to treat the autoimmune, they, they just wanted to treat symptoms, and I knew that there was more to it. And uh, so, um, yes, I was uh, diagnosed on symptoms and biomarkers for, the, everyone always thought I had rheumatoid arthritis, but it's, it is not rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it could be lupus, it could be any number of other arthritis symptoms and fibromyalgia and all these different labels that they that they have um, but uh, from eliminating the grains and the sugar and the starches for me um, and then taking it the next step after reading your book and, and discovering the, the things that I was still eating that I wasn't sure and uh, whether they bothered me and the, the thing that can be really confusing is unless you dissect your diet, to where you're only eating, testing one thing at a time, you don't really know and unless you are able to read a book like yours and you see that, oh, well, you know, sure, if you're eating cashew chicken and it's got eight other ingredients in it, how do you know it's the cashews? But uh, it makes, <laughs> it's obviously the cashews. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, one of the interesting things is um, lupus uh, is what we call the great masquerader. And there's actually now over 200,000 cases of lupus in the United States each year. And all the autoimmune diseases, as you know, we have this incredible epidemic. Uh, when I was first in training, autoimmune diseases were so rare that uh, we used to, the tests we'd get for them back then, we called them funny tests because they were really funny because we never really got them very much. Hmm. But now, you know, every commercial on TV is for uh, immunosuppressive treatment for right. you know these common autoimmune diseases right. but lupus is the great masquerader and lupus interestingly enough arthritis is one of the biggest presentations of lupus uh, most people think it's skin rashes that it's a butterfly rash on the face or rashes elsewhere but in, certainly in my practice, we see a great number of people who have lupus as their arthritis. That's their marker. The other thing is lupus is really good at destroying kidneys. There's such a thing as lupus nephritis. Hmm. And you may have no symptoms. You have no other signs, but you may have your doctor says, gee, it's funny, your kidneys don't work very well. Hmm. And they never even bothered to look to see if it could be lupus nephritis. Right. So... Uh, People with fibromyalgia, it's often lupus as the, as the cause of that. Mm. And one of the things you found out is that we do have I mean, really good immunosuppressant drugs out there. And mm -hmm. as a transplant immunologist, I got up close and personal with you know immunosuppressant drugs. Mm -hmm. And what I try to convince people, and I compliment you for not going down that road. It wasn't easy. <laughs> is that, you know, you don't have a heart transplant in you. You don't have a kidney transplant in you. Right. These are drugs that are designed to make your immune system not respond to a foreign object like right. a heart or a kidney. And what got me interested in this whole area is that you and other people, believe it or not, I 
have anti-nuclear antibody that I can turn on and turn off. Mm. I presented myself as a, as a paper at the American Heart Association earlier this year. Wow. So uh, this is very common, and the point is it's foreign bodies that are invading us. Now, I happen to think that one of these foreign bodies is a foreign protein called a lectin. Right. And by eliminating grains, you're eliminating a lot of lectin-containing foods. And what I've tried to do is get even farther along the line. Would you mind, I don't want to put you on the spot, can you hold up your fingers oh. and you know, yes. see these cute little nodules? Yes. Aren't they lovely? <laughs> so uh, early on, uh, I used to see a lot of women uh, that would come in with these nodules and they'd say, oh, this is just, you know, arthritis, it's perfectly normal. And I take a lot of Advil and Aleve and I get through the day. Right. And one of the earliest things I found by having women follow this diet they usually brought their husbands in for me to fix. Um, <laughs> but they were usually thin women with these nodules. Okay. And as we went along, they'd come in and say, I want you to look at my hands. The nodules are gone. And they would, you know, and sure enough, they were, they were gone. And now you know, all of my patients, particularly with lupus as an arthritic marker, uh, you can get these things to go away. Well, I'm so excited. You know, I'm, I'm trying your lectin uh, elimination right now, and I've already experienced uh, definite lessening of my painful symptoms. So uh, I have still have a long ways to go because I've only been doing this for maybe six weeks, and uh, I've definitely discovered things that I should never have been eating all this time. And so I'm so anxious to see what other things will happen. <laughs> well, you know, we're all in this together. And uh, for instance, um, last year when the Plant Paradox came out, um, one of the first podcasts that I went on was Joseph Mercola's podcast. Right. And I've been a big fan of his uh, for a very long time. And we got before the podcast started. He said, uh, you know, "How come I don't know about you? I I <laughs> should have known about you." Right. And, he, and he said, "This is so important about lectins that he had a cookbook coming out for his you know fat for fuel uh, yeah. book." And he says, "We've actually stopped the production on that wow. cookbook, and we're removing lectins from the recipes." I'm that Smart. impressed with you know. And he said. You know, why didn't I know about this? Right, and right. So, you know, good for you for doing this. Um, so, well, I do, excuse me for interrupting you, but I do wish that I had read your book <laughs> before I finished mine because I would have changed some things. But uh, thank goodness so where I call for a zucchini, as you've said, it, uh, you can use the baby zucchini and peel them and seed them. Or uh, Yeah, I think those are important tricks. We, mm -hmm. we know that um, the immature, like zucchini or yellow squash, for instance, if they, or even a cucumber, if they haven't started forming seeds yet, they're usually quite low in lectin content. So the baby stuff's pretty safe, and then all you do is peel the skin off where right. the other lectins are, and, you know, and you're good to go. And, you know, in part three of the program, we have people start reintroducing lectins, right. and they, some people say, oops, even these guys uh, I react to. But yeah. great, great amount of time, the people can get away with things just fine. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Uh, I was, uh, years ago, I was talking with Lauren Cordain, who mm -hmm. is the professor at Colorado State, who actually is the father of the paleo diet. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were actually going to do a book together. And we're kind of talking about things. And... I said, well, you know, uh, we got to have a lot of chia seed recipes. Oh. And he says, what? He says, don't you read the literature? And I said, what do you mean? Of course I read the literature. He said, no, you don't. He said, chia seeds are an American seed, and they're loaded with lectins, and they cause inflammation in wow. humans. And I said, oh, come on. And he says, I'm going to send you two papers right now, and you know, call me back. So <laughs> he, he emailed me the papers, and sure enough, there was a human study looking at whether the omega-3s in chia seeds mm -hmm. would be incorporated into us, you know, omega-3, the good fat. And so they designed a study where 
half the group got chia seeds and the other half got a different seed that looked like a chia seed. I think it was a poppy seed, mm -hmm. which are safe. Uh, yeah. And so the group that got the chia seeds, <laughs> sure enough, their omega-3s went up in their bloodstream. Uh. And great. But they said, well, omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, so we're going to measure markers of inflammation, including C-reactive protein. And lo and behold, the chia seed group, even though their omega-3s went up, their inflammation went up. Oh, and I went, yeah. ah, you know, how can yeah. I be so stupid? So, uh, you know, we, we can't be uh, smart on everything all the time. How many years ago was this? Oh, gosh, this must have been almost 10 years ago now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Boy, boy. Almost 10 well, years Well, that was ago. one of the first things I discovered because I don't really use, I use psyllium husk mostly mm -hmm. as a binder. Perfectly and, safe. And uh, my recipes, but I, I don't use much flax or chia, but I do like chia seeds. And... Uh, I, that was one of the first things when I, when I read your book. I was like, oh, chia seeds. It's like, I'm going to try that right now. And I had chia seeds on an empty stomach with a little uh, yogurt. And uh, yogurt I'm okay with. And uh, the chia seeds immediately, I noticed, gave me a stomach ache. And I, I, I was shocked <laughs> because when I've eaten them in the past and maybe gotten a stomach ache, I hadn't... I, yeah, I connection. hadn't made the connection that it was a chia seed. So I you know, blamed it on everything else, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, it, it, I love your book because of this. <laughs> no, yeah, I w you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, but the evidence is out there. We just have to be willing to accept some of this, right. what sounds craziness. Right. Well, unfortunately, so many... Um, of our doctors don't know they aren't aware of, of this or uh, the nutrition that can be helpful and um, for instance when my uh, when my rheumatologist saw this and he tried to convince me it was osteoarthritis that my joints had just worn out and I was like what <laughs> that doesn't even make sense you know the first joint of my fingers are wearing out I don't think so so you know when you get advice like that from a doctor it makes you not want to go back and look for other alternatives um, Thanks Let's come back and talk about that. Okay. Let's take a break and okay. we'll be back. So welcome back. We're talking today with Annabelle Lee, who's the author of the ultimate grain-free <laughs> cookbook. The ultimate. <laughs> so uh, you brought some ultimate grain-free goodies for us. Yes. Why don't you tell me about the book and some of your favorite recipes, which I assume you brought for us today. Yes, I did. I did. Well, uh, when I first started cooking this way and I wanted to eliminate the starches and the grains and that, um, something in my little brain thought, you know, uh, real foods, whole foods, have fiber and starches and uh, oils and that that they bring with them. And I thought, you know, I have a food processor and I have a blender and why not use whole foods and make some of these comfort foods? and toss ditch those starches and and uh, awful flowers and I just started experimenting and doing exactly that I actually used the food processor in the beginning mostly but my husband who has seven sisters <laughs> and they don't all like to cook um, one told me Anna I, I love your recipes but I just I, I'm afraid of a food processor <laughs> Really? So I said, okay, let's see, let me do more with the blender. And so I, I reworked a lot of them because everyone owns a blender and it's it's so easy. Now, do you need a high, do you need a heavy duty blender? Well, I happen to own a Vitamix that I just love and is worth every penny. Um, but I believe that most of any decent blender um, will blend these up because there's nothing too uh, too difficult to do with it. Uh, you just run it a little longer if you need to for a smoother batter. Um, but I also discovered that we don't have to cook the vegetables or the fruit uh, before we use them. Uh, we just toss them in the blend, chop them up, toss them in the blender, the food processor, and you cook them afterwards. So that eliminates uh, a step. There's a lot of recipes uh, where people do use uh, add you know, different squash or something to the recipe, but uh, they always cook them. And I thought, why, why do they cook them? They get cooked afterwards anyway. So that's what this is. This is uh, yam gnocchi, and uh, it's made with uh, uh, raw orange uh, yams and uh, almond flour and coconut flour and uh, egg. 
and um, a little psyllium is a binder for it. And it, I think it's delicious. And, and do you cook them the same way? I mean, do you boil them no, and let them float you can, up? Or? You can do that, um, but uh, the way I like to cook them is I toss them in olive oil mm -hmm. in, a, in a skillet with a lid, mm -hmm. and I pop them in the oven for 20 minutes. And that way they stay a little more intact and they don't soak up quite as much um, water. So um, uh -huh. that's uh, that's how I prefer to cook them. Mm. <laughs> I'm a huge, <coughs> huge fan of gnocchi. Uh, Yay. Uh, and it's always so hard. I'm going to talk with my mouth full. Good. <laughs> uh, to get gnocchi that tastes like gnocchi. Um, right. And I want more olive oil on it, but next time. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing, while I'm here, we have this beautiful basil, mm. and as everybody knows, I'm a huge basil fan. Oh, me so, too. I'm, mm, me too. Perfect. Oh. Really good. Thank you. Yeah, really well, good. I have several gnocchi recipes in my book where you can use, uh, rather than the yam, you can enter, uh, uh, use the cauliflower or broccoli or carrot, just about any any vegetable that you want to use, you can use. Um, you might just have to adjust a tiny bit of coconut flour, you know, which you, after you start cooking this way, you, you quickly learn how to do that. <laughs> well, you know, I think one of the things, you know, you were cooking for four boys and you were tricking them. Yes. <laughs> and one of the things that I tried to do with our cookbook, and I applaud you, is parents, when, when I'm on radio shows, particularly from the Midwest and the South, Everybody says, how do I save my kids' lives? How we're killing, you know, my children, mm -hmm. uh, either with the food at school or out to eat. How do, we, how do we get good food into them? What are, you know, what are the tricks? Well, the first, the first thing that I did was uh, changed my entire pantry, my cupboards, my refrigerator. You can't keep the same crap in there and think that you're not going to use it. So uh, you replace it and you find the replacements, and I provide some of that on my website and in the book, things that, that you can use instead of. And uh, uh, once you have those in your cupboard, it's much easier to start using. And then when you have the cookbooks that, that walk you through it, then it is even easier. But I say, you don't need to say anything to your kids. You just start cooking this way. And I'm sorry, but I I know that it is not as uh, it's a little more laborious than going to the uh, downtown uh, fast food place and grabbing a pizza. But if you want to improve your life and your children's life, you have to put the effort in. And uh, some of it is starting right up here with just changing your way of thinking about uh, not being sucked into what biz big business and big pharmacy and that tells us. And it's just like, go ahead and be sick and fat and tired and unhealthy and take a pill and yeah, you'll be okay, you know. And we don't, none of us want to bring our kids up with that when we've started realizing what's happened over these decades um, that uh, if we can change it, uh, it starts with our it starts with our head, our mindset, and then uh, just a little old school learning. And uh, that's why I love the blenders in that these days because it kind of makes it fun. And if you've got younger kids there, they're like, "Wow, you can throw you know throw this apple in here and you know make these cupcakes." And it's it can be fun, it really can. But yeah. you have to put the time in. You do. That's true. But it, so do you kind of do what some working parents do? Do you make batches, say, on a Saturday or a Sunday? I used to, but now that my boys are grown and mostly out of the house, <laughs> I don't do that so much because it's uh, I'm cooking more for my husband and I. Uh, and sometimes I will do that, but quite honestly, I kind of prefer a shorter time in the kitchen um, uh, more often than spending the day meal prepping. That's just not so much my style. But I will say that there are times when I'm lazy and I don't want to cook at all. And um, uh, that's one reason why we made our baking mix because uh, um, I wanted a slice of bread sometimes and I didn't feel like coming down and spending 20 minutes making the, the loaf. Right. So, um, so I have a baking mix now that I can just pull out of the cupboard and add a couple things and the next thing you know, you've got a loaf of baked bread and and it makes life much easier. <laughs> so this is from your baking mix? Yes, this is, yes. Oh, wow. Now, what, what flavors do you this have? This is a baguette, yeah. and I don't really have flavors, but we do have, you're able to make a, a sandwich loaf, or uh, hamburger buns, or baguettes, 
or cinnamon roll. I saw a cinnamon roll yes, mix. Yes, yes, cinnamon roll was a big favorite uh, with the boys, and I usually use erythritol and monk fruit to sweeten. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, it tastes to me, it tastes just like real bread. You can toast this up in the oven even, and it gets crunchy and crispy on the outside. It's made with almonds and coconut and psyllium and eggs. And um, we do have a, a local bakery here that um, makes uh, vegan uh, hamburger buns for the food service industry. Mm. So uh, they're using a similar recipe to this, but it's vegan. Mm. So no eggs. No eggs. Yeah. But basically your recipe. Yes, my yeah. recipe. And we're working on uh, the newest is uh, an organic mix that will also be nut free unless, of course, the FDA classifies coconut as a nut. It so isn't, you, it is a true okay. nut. <laughs> okay, so it, I guess so I can't call it nut free, but it doesn't use almonds. Um, even though I think almonds are great once the skins are removed, um, uh, there's a lot of people that still don't want to use it, I guess. so. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, we certainly ask people to get this peel off of almonds as a much safer, but I have several rheumatoid arthritis patients who go on a kind of an almond flour kick, every, everything, oh. and yeah. they, they react to really? a lot of almonds. So mm -hmm. also, uh, almonds are, as you probably know, very water intensive, and they huge, huge amounts of water. And in right. California, right. Uh, with our drought, uh, yeah. we do have to be careful about uh, tree nuts That's in true. general, but almonds are the most water intensive of all of all the nuts. Oh, okay. So we'll see just another good reason to all right. maybe have another All right, choice. so so we've had we've had a fabulous Italian dinner and I gotta put in my favorite line, remember the only purpose of bread is <laughs> to is. get <laughs> olive oil into your mouth. <laughs> That's true. And really uh, what I like to do with bread, if I am going to eat and I'm going to eat yours, is use it as a sponge for olive oil. And yes. one of the things early on in my study of the Italians was we'd go to these little trattorias of, up what are called white roads, little towns, and they'd bring bread to the table, but you'd see that the Italians would never touch the bread, un unlike Americans who, you know, right. were tearing into the bread immediately. And they'd only start tearing a piece of bread when they'd finish a course and they'd pour olive oil into the bowl or the plate and then they'd take the bread and you know just wow. sop it up and mm. I have so many ruined shirts from <laughs> olive oil dripping off whatever I was using but and I finally asked one one day I said you know in my halting Italian you know, why, why do you do that he said well you know the only purpose of bread is to get olive oil into your mouth that's yeah. Why else would you eat it? <laughs> and they were right. It's just a sponge. Right. So now you got a perfect sponge that won't kill you. There you go. Wonderful. That's right. Wonderful. It, it's funny when you bring up the olive oil that we were talking during the break a little bit, and um, I mentioned that I used some that was very bitter because it had been pressed with the seeds, I guess, and then you suggested another type that I could try. I think maybe even some people who uh, have mistakenly bought the brands that maybe I bought before and they've never actually tasted really good olive oil and uh, I, I mean that's that's a big difference in whether or not you're going to love what you're sopping up and putting in your mouth or it's going to taste a little bit bitter oh but you know Dr. Gundry tells me how healthy this is for me but it's so well bitter. the bitter olive oil is actually the most healthiest of all the <gasps> olive oils because more the seed bitter, is pressed? No, and more bitter, more better. Um, oh. If olive oil, the seed is pressed, is actually the final process of making cheap olive oil, and it's right. actually labeled pumice, P-U-M-I-C-E. Okay. We almost never see that in the United States. It's used primarily as a cooking oil in Italy, but if it's bitter, the more bitterness actually is the polyphenol content, and the polyphenols oh. are actually what give olive oil its health benefits. Okay. So more bitter, more better. Okay. But a lot of people when they're getting to know olive oil don't want that bitterness. I, I look for it. Okay. But there are olive oils that actually have very little bitterness. They taste buttery. Some mm -hmm. actually taste grassy. Uh, mm -hmm. So have a fun olive oil tasting 
you know, go to, you can even go to Trader Joe's, uh, just as an example, mm -hmm. and buy four or five olive oils, and they're, and they're not expensive. Or go mm -hmm. to Costco and buy several of their olive oils. They're not expensive. And then get some of your bread uh, mm -hmm. or some <laughs> of your gnocchi and put some out and try each one. And you're going to find one that you go, oh, I like this. And right. you're going to say, whoo, that one, you know. That when right. not, I cough whenever I, I eat that. And believe right. it or not, coughing when you try olive oil is one of the best ways to judge that it's got huge amounts of polyphenol. Wow. Yeah. Well, that is some really interesting so, uh, yeah, more bitter, notes more I've bitter. never heard. Okay. okay, I will remember that. Okay, so we've had all this great uh, gnocchi, and we've had bread dipped in olive oil, and now it's time for, de for the dessert. So what do you got for dessert? Okay, so we have uh, what I call jammies, and they're, uh, the base is made with a just right banana and a few other goodies in there. And then uh, the jam is a raw jam, apricot, and uh, I make raw jam by combining uh, a little bit of dried fruit with fresh fruit in the food processor and uh, maybe a drop of monk fruit if you need it but uh, it blends up to a really nice consistency for a raw jam and you get all those good enzymes and that that we don't tend to eat enough of. I think raw food is important in our diet. Yeah, my wife and I uh, were raw foodists for nine months uh, and I must say it was probably the healthiest nine months of my life. Wow. The problem with being a raw foodist is it's rather impractical, particularly if you're traveling as much as, as we do. Uh, also, it's interesting, the vast majority of raw food chefs who became very famous as raw food chefs give it up, yeah. which is fascinating to yeah. me. Uh, Labor intensive, isn't it? <laughs> it? It takes a lot of work and a, and a lot of concentration, but I think you're right. The, the benefits are, are definitely there. So, you know, the more we can get raw foods into our diet, we eat about 85% of our food raw. Uh, which uh, I think is a reasonable compromise. Mm -hmm. but sure, I, sure. Yeah, I, but so, okay, so I'm going to have my dessert. And, I, and good for you, you're not slathering this with a big giant thing of jam. No, you're just adding you some don't flavor, need it. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, mm. a little flavor. And apricots are in season. And it is great flavor. Mm -hmm. So, what you. you're saying is, I can have all this great stuff, and I'm going to actually improve my health, even though I think. I'm, you know, I'm, this is really decadent. I'm, you know, I'm spoiling myself, right? Right. Okay, now let's just, I'm going to be a naysayer for a minute. Why, why go to the trouble? Maybe this is all in your head that, you know, oh, I react to gluten and oh, I react to corn. And maybe this is, uh, this is a placebo effect. Uh, what say you? <laughs> well, my experience, uh, I know that it's not the placebo effect because I have stopped and started on just to double check and make sure that this was exactly what was either uh, bothering me or not. And uh, I think when people uh, experience it, whether they're suffering from pain or digestive issues or just uh, uh, illness like diabetes or uh, carrying too much weight, when they allot a certain amount of time for their health and uh, uh, to do something like this, eliminating grains and lectins, etc., uh, when they experience the difference, they'll know it's not the placebo effect. So it's not something that, that you just have to listen to me or even listen to you. you Try it for yourself. It's not that hard to do. You know, you're on this earth for quite a few years. If you want, if you can spend a few weeks and and uh, test out something that so many people have benefited from, then it, it just makes sense to me that they would want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, one of my favorite stories that I, I t tell in the book um, about a young college student from Wisconsin who had Crohn's disease. And she was uh, treated by a very eminent professor at the Mayo Clinic. And she um, was given my two-page list of don't eat this and don't eat this by one of her uh, advisors. And uh, she asked if I could talk to her on Skype. And it was around Christmas time a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And she, 
she got on the Skype and she said, you know, I've been on every diet for Crohn's and my professor says diet has nothing to do with it. Oh. And, but you know, my, my advisor said, you know, you really got to try this. And she said, after two weeks, I started having the first normal bowel movements in my life. And I've had normal bowel movements, you know, ever since. So oh. she said a few days ago, I called my professor at the Mayo Clinic to tell him, you know, that I was cured of Crohn's. And he says, what do you mean? She said, well, you know, I've been following this kind of two-page list. And he said, well, don't be ridiculous. Food has nothing to do with Crohn's. It's genetic. You know, you've been, you've been shammed. You know, this is, this is a placebo effect. And she said, I was so upset I got off the phone with him. And my mother was baking Christmas cookies. Uh -huh. And she said, I, I ate two Christmas cookies. And within about an hour, I started having intense abdominal cramps. And then I had to run to the bathroom, and I had bloody diarrhea. Oh. And she says, now, I'm fine now. I went right back. She says, but, you know, why don't doctors know about this? And, and I told her, and I tell anyone who will listen, that you can't see unless your eyes are open. And right. unfortunately for most physicians, our eyes have been closed that food could have that dramatic effect on us. Uh, because we've been told it doesn't. You know, we've right. been told by big food, big pharma, big chemical, that food has very little to do with anything about right. our health. Right. So I really appreciate you coming on oh. today and Thank you so telling much for us having your story. <laughs> and you, you know, I, I can't. You got to stay in touch because I want to. I want to see if getting rid of a few more of these. Oh yes, I'm guys, working. We'll make yes. these guys go away. I'm working on it. Oh. It, you will be the first person. <laughs> I will definitely stay in touch because I have noticed a difference already. So I promised you at the start that we were going to talk about oats. And we actually are going to talk about oats because we had a question from Nita. Nita writes, good morning. Does soaking old-fashioned oats overnight and rinsing next day remove lectins? Well, Nita, that's a great question. And answers two parts. Number one, there's no human need for oats. Oats are a grain. Oats are useful for fattening horses for winter, according to my oldest daughter, who is an excellent horsewoman and who should know. We have no need for oats. Number two, there is a lectin in oats that cross-reacts with gluten. That means your body can't tell the difference between a gluten lectin and an oat lectin. Mm. Part two of the answer is, does soaking help remove lectins? And the answer is yes. Soaking always helps remove lectins and rinsing multiple times. That's why traditional cultures almost always soak lectin-containing grains. For instance, the Incas soaked quinoa for 48 hours, and then they fermented it, and then they cooked it, and it's not on the package directions. So your answer is, does it help remove lectins? Yes, but more importantly, there is no human need for oats unless you're a horse and you want to get fat. <laughs> and it's exactly what's going to happen to you when you use your oatmeal for breakfast. So I hope that answers. And really good question, Nita. How do people find you? What's your website? Well, my website is californiacountrygal.com. And uh, they can find me there. They can find me on Instagram. They can find me on Facebook. And uh, uh, actually, my husband and I will be doing a Kickstarter campaign starting next month. Aha! Uh -huh. Yes, to be able to bring out new organic mixes and a, a broader line rather than just the, the baked breads that we have other goodies. And can you out. get your mixes in a, in a grocery store yet, or is it all online? There's, they're in a few uh, grocery stores, the select grocery stores, but basically we're on Amazon and on our website right now. Okay. And So um, they can go to Amazon? Yes, they can go to Amazon. And, and I'm going to find out, as you know, we have an Amazon page for Gundry MD, ah. and i got to make sure we get your stuff <gasps> oh, <yay>. on there. Oh, <laughs> yay. That would be wonderful. So, <laughs> wonderful. so if you're listening or watching, check Gundry MD Amazon page, and we'll get it on there as soon as we can. Awesome. Okay. Oh, thank All you right. so much, Dr. Gundry, and thank you for the work that you're doing. And I can't wait to see your new book that you're writing and uh, learn even more. All right. <laughs> well, we're going to have a quick start plant paradox program 
out in January, and then the next big hardcover is The Longevity Paradox. Uh -huh. How to Die Young at a Ripe Old Age. I like that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good luck with the book, and thank you. please check this book out. Take control not only of your health, but your family's health. And any of my female listeners, this is such a true story in our medical field right now that your complaints are not given enough validity when you go to your health care provider. And don't stop looking until you find someone who will take you seriously. And yes. So I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Take care of yourself. 